the White Bone Demon, Monkey King, and the Belt and Road Initiative. What's the connection? Welcome to this special edition of Headline Buster, brought to you by The Point with me, Li Xin. In this series, I dissect stories that are making headlines around the world and talk to my guests to make up for the missing, some deliberately, pieces of the puzzle. The White Bone Demon and the Monkey King, a main antagonist and protagonist of the household Chinese classical novel, Journey to the West, about Meng Xuanzang's pilgrimage to search for Buddhist scriptures. In order to trick and capture Xuanzang, whose flesh brings immortality when eaten, the demon impersonates first as a fair maiden, then her aged mother and father, respectively. However, the Monkey King, a disciple of Xuanzang is too clear-headed to be fooled. He sees through the demon schemes and strikes her down each time until revealing her true form, a pile of white bones. A gruesome story, I know, but what's the connection to our focus today, the media coverage of the Belt and Road Initiative in the past decade? Well, we have browsed about 1,500 stories from mainstream intermedia outlets published since the beginning of last year. And almost everywhere we looked, we saw that this initiative was perceived through a thick geopolitical lens, albeit in very different forms. Hence, I thought of the story of the white demon and the monkey king. Does my analogy add up? Honest mistakes can happen, but uh, if it happens repeatedly over the years, maybe it's time for me to take a close look. So, without much ado, let's pick up the cudgel. Ha! The first impersonation, the fair maiden, is comparing the BRI to a dead trap, the West's main narrative about the BRI, which appeared in 2017 when an Indian academic coined the phrase before it went viral in the world. A very fair maiden indeed. The idea is that China lends huge loans to poorer countries for infrastructure projects to entrap them, rendering them dependent on China. Here are some examples. The diplomat, China, dead trap. The economist, the perils of China's Dead trap diplomacy. The BBC, China is a burdening poor countries with unsustainable debt. Personally, I'm wary of this topic as it's an old tried one. I interviewed the then Sri Lankan ambassador to China as early as 2018 to talk about it. But since so many people still don't get it, I'll be charitable and explain it once again. This Washington Post story published in July 2022, for instance, is titled China has a hand in Sri Lanka's economic calamity. It says one of the major players in Sri Lanka's calamity is China and that Sri Lanka walked into what Beijing critics have dubbed China's dead trap diplomacy. But what's the Sri Lankan perspective, if that matters? This is what the former Sri Lankan ambassador told me in 2018. It is up to the government of Sri Lanka to build on the basis of feasibility studies, then to make business decision. Uh, it, Chinese government never asked to hand over the port to Chinese government or any Chinese venture. Mm. It is proposal came from Sri Lanka asking partnership from China because it's a Chinese money which we have used. Let me repeat, the Chinese government never asks us to hand over the port to China or any Chinese ventures. It's a proposal that came from Sri Lanka. Four years later, his successor, Ambassador Palita Kohona, said this in 2022. We came to China. China did not come to Sri Lanka with a bag full of dollars and say, here's the money spent. We came to China. We are finding it difficult to pay back loans, but most of these loans are not from China. So, hear him again. We came to China. We were finding it difficult to pay back loans, most of which are not from China. The logic is very simple, according to Ali Savary, Sri Lankan Minister of Foreign Affairs. 
No, I don't think so. Uh, what are they going to achieve out of the debt trap? You know, if you put your money into a country for investment, obviously they want returns. So if you want return, you want to see that that country succeeds. So that debt trap narrative looks more like a journalistic booby trap to me, but with a wet fuse. If you scratch beneath the surface, you realize it doesn't hold water. The fact that such a story can sell for so long makes me question the collective IQs of uh, analysts, commentators, and maybe editors as well. Regardless, we'll keep trying and let's delve further. Now, the fair maiden scheme didn't work. Here comes an old woman, the second impersonation of the white bone demon. The association of the BRI with so-called neo-colonialism. That really takes the biscuit coming from the uh, Western countries. The pot calling the kettle black. <laughs> but, but let's leave that aside for now. This time, the media read more like an old woman putting on an act. Look what you've done. These countries are now on the brink of bankruptcy and you take advantage of the situation to plunder their resources. Well, I have to remind people that the BRI is not the first and only handle with which some associate China of neo-colonialism. When China steps up its engagement with African countries, goodness gracious me, it's neo-colonialism. China and Africa, win-win development, or a neo-colonialism. When China invests in Latin America, here we go again, neo-colonialism. Is China the world's new colonial power? To be fair, these headlines are not making the claim, simply asking. But that does the trick, very subtle. Should I try that too? And when China's cooperating with its neighbors in Asia, one more time, neo-colonialism. Mahatir, China, and neo-colonialism. This one is also very clever. It doesn't make a claim, nor does it ask a question. It just puts China and neo-colonialism next to each other, and that does the job on your mind. Speaking of the art of writing headlines. And I just mentioned Sri Lanka. Well, of course, neo-colonialism. Can the reports back up these claims, explicit or hidden? Let's dissect one, for example. This Guardian story dwells on the usual suspects, the mega plan, the radical transformation, and the debt distress in Africa. How about the benefits for the African people? You find it in passing in the last two paragraphs, if you ever get there. Also, a McKinsey survey revealed that Chinese firms in Africa have recruited 89% of their employees locally. That's a lot of food for thought. How much mention does such numbers get? Let me be fair. The international media do report on the other side of the argument. The Nikkei did an interview with the Ugandan president, uh, Yoweri Museveni, in 2022. He was quoted as saying, Africa has been having debt problems for at least the last 600 years due to the slave trade, colonialism, neo-colonialism, and none of it was from China. China supported Africans' fight against colonialism before starting economic activity on the continent. At least some balance. But it's like a needle in a haystack. You'll be hard-pressed to find such comments in the beginning of any article, let alone the headline where most people probably stop at. So, that trap, neo-colonialism, what other laurel has been passed out upon the BRI? Let's go back to the white bone demon. Her plan has been thwarted twice, and she tries even harder, this time impersonating as an elderly man, looking for his wife and daughter. What happened to my poor daughter and her mother? He sheds some fake tears. Likewise, after the debt trap and neo-colonialism accusations, some in the media crank it up to 11. That's the hegemonic ambition wild card, kind of last-ditch attempt to throw mud at the BRI. There's been no shortage of that. China wants an alternative world order. China is ready to take over the world. China is testing the West. And they come from media powerhouses like the FT, the diplomat, and The Economist. And the list goes on. That trap, neo-colonialism, hegemony, 
After 10 years of constant messaging, it would take someone with X-ray eyes to see through the surface. Mang Xuanzang was definitely kind and gullible. He insisted that the fair maiden and her poor parents were real human beings instead of a demon in disguise, jeopardizing his own life and his mission. The Monkey King was even temporarily banished for hurting innocent people. But some may ask, Shin, are you cherry-picking your samples among the thousands of stories on the BRI over the last 10 years? Okay, here's how we did it. We searched the keywords of belt and road from 14 mainstream international publications in the United States and in the UK since the beginning of last year till September of this year. And we did an analysis of all of these stories, including the headlines and the bodies of the article. Here's what we found. Now, first, the word cloud of the main words of the most frequently used words in the headlines. Understandably, China-related words rank high, but also words such as the United States, Russia, and Ukraine, ranking much higher than words such as trade, economic, and cooperation. Clearly, the BRA is seen through the prism of China-US competition. This is the word cloud of the most frequently used words in the bodies of these articles. Again, the United States ranks particularly high, even higher than Beijing. Russia is mentioned as much as Beijing, and together, words related to geopolitics largely outshine development, trade, people, you know, words that matter to developing countries. In conclusion, these uh, 1,500 stories perceive the BRI almost entirely through a geopolitical prism. They perceive it as an arena for major country competition. Few reports focus on the local impacts on ordinary people's livelihood, economic development, or technology transfers. Ten years on, against the negative narrative, the BRI has brought concrete changes on the ground. Like it or not, the World Bank estimates BRI will help increase the GDP of East Asian and Pacific developing countries by 2.6 to 3.9 percent on average. According to London-based Consultants Center for Economics and Business Research, BRI is likely to increase the world GDP by $7 trillion per year by 2040. Now we're talking. Geopolitics matter. Development matters more. It's been 10 years since China's Belt and Road Initiative was first proposed. As the country's signature initiative, we can trust it to the international mainstream media that they will continue to scrutinize it. The novel Journey to the West is a constant reminder that the white bone demon may be lurking in the shadows. But hopefully, as the story goes, these controversies will eventually end up just like her, a pile of white bones bleaching in the sun. We'll take a short break and uh, we'll be back right after that to discuss some of the unanswered questions on this topic. Stay with us. Making sense of the overwhelming wave of information means cutting through the noise to shine a light on the heart of the story and making room for new perspectives. True understanding means the ability to see events from more than one side. I'm Liu Xin, and this is The Point. Welcome back to this special edition of uh, Headline Buster with uh, me, Lu Xin, coming to you from Beijing. And we have been talking about the connection between the Belt and Road Initiative and the Monkey King and the White Bone Demon. I hope you got the story. But anyway, to help you unpack exactly why the BRI has made a difference and uh, what kind of difference is going, continue going to make around the world, I have four guests from around the world to join me for panel discussion, they are Mr. Zhang Jianyu, Executive Director of the BRI Green Development Institute, joining me from Beijing. I have uh, Yasiru Rana Raja, Founding Director of the Belt and Road Initiative Sri Lanka or Brussels. 
He's also joining us from Beijing. We have Charles Okechuku Ono Naiju, director of the Center for China Studies of Nigeria. He's joining us very early in the morning from Abuja, the capital of Nigeria. Last but not least, we have Hussein Askari, vice president of the Belt and Road Institute in Sweden, who is also strategic analyst of the Schiller Institute, and he's joining us from Shanghai. Gentlemen, welcome to Headline Buster. Let me go to Mr. Zhang Jianyu first. Um, as I said in my opening monologue, and we have probably all sensed over the past 10 years, the international coverage of the Belt and Road Initiative has more or less dwelled on the theme of geopolitical competition or major power competition instead of economic perspective. What factors do you think contributed to that? Well, I think, uh, uh, you know, certainly, you know, the Chinese BRI initiative has been uh, applauded uh, by many countries and uh, uh, international organizations. Uh, there are indeed uh, concerns and uh, uh, questions has been addressed, uh, particularly by the, uh, you know, some of the Western uh, countries. And in addition to what you just mentioned about you know, the uh, geopolitics uh, and also uh, you know, power competition, and uh, you know, just name a few, you know, some people are concerned of the, uh, the debt issues, uh, people are concerned of the uh, transparency issues, and uh, there's also uh, concerns uh, arising from uh, economic and social impacts. And I think it was mostly, in my will, it's driven really uh, from uh, you know, three uh, sort of wheels uh, that reside with the uh, with the Western world. The first one is really ignorance and, and prejudice, because you know when they uh, first encountered BRI, you know they immediately look at within their own lenses and they compare uh, you know their own Marshall Plan, of, you know plundering interests from right. developing countries, and they immediately think. China is doing, is doing similar thing. And mm -hmm. second, I think definitely driven by their own economic interests, you know, their long-held interests in the other countries, and China is, you know, is a newcomer. And thirdly, is certainly the geopolitics and uh, power competition. But I, I really want to say that I, I think, you know, China is not afraid of these concerns or, or, or questions. And China, throughout the 10 years, uh, while standing by its own uh, commitment and, you know, to the BRI and sustainable development, but China is really adjusting itself to you know, try to address some of its concerns. In my subject, uh, you know, one of the biggest announcements China made in 2021 is China will stop building coal power power plants overseas and right. help other developing countries to develop. Let's focus on one of the biggest stories uh, attached to the BRI, which is debt issue. And let me go to Mr. Rana Raja, since you are from Sri Lanka, and Sri Lanka has been uh, one of the center focal point of this debt issue. Um, I understand Sri Lanka has recently made the headline following its debt restructuring plan. At a regular press conference on October the 10th, China's foreign ministry spokesperson Wang Wenbing said that China engaged in active bilateral consultations and provided a final financing support document to Sri Lanka in a timely manner to help it obtain loans from the IMF in late September. As official creditor, the Export-Import Bank of China tentatively agreed with Sri Lanka on the debt treatment. Help us understand the story. In 2022, Sri Lanka went bankrupt. And uh, did it have anything to do with loans from China? Go to the debt debt problem in Sri Lanka, there is a debt problem, I'm not denying that, but it's not a Chinese debt problem. Actually, Chinese uh, loans, which c came at concessional rates, were helpful for Sri Lanka 10 years ago. It started 10 years ago. One of the first investments was the CICT terminal, uh, uh, and it helped to build the terminal, a deep terminal. No one talks about it. The ambition of the Sri Lankan government for the past 10, 20 years was to make Sri Lanka a maritime hub. So. The investments came through BRI, around two billion, came to uh, invest uh, infrastructure development, especially in maritime sector. So today, ten years gone, the CICT terminal is the biggest terminal in the region. It's one of the top terminals in the world right now. So if we digitalize that, uh, that would give us a lot of uh, you know foreign uh, income to the ca country. Chinese loans came as assets. You can come to Sri Lanka and see the see the loans are actually there. You go to Hambantota port, you see the road infrastructure. Mm. 
power generation uh, uh, power stations we have built. You have seen the ports around Sri Lanka. So there is visually uh, the two, three billion that China put in Sri Lanka. That is visually there today, practically there. So. I think, uh, uh, to answer your question, I think uh, China agree. China has always supported Sri Lanka in many yeah. cases. Mr. Askari, as uh, Mr. Mr. Rana Raja just mentioned, uh, you have uh, written about this subject uh, numerous times. Do you uh, expect that with the loan restructuring uh, arrangement uh, uh, involving the IMF that the detractors will go quiet about the debt trap? Because China obviously will not set a debt trap for itself, right? Do you expect the detractors to go quiet this time? And why did they pick this term, this narrative in the first place and keep playing with it? There are two, three problems. First, what is the cause of the financial distress of those countries? Mm. And it has nothing to do with China. Number two, what is China's share of the loans to those countries? Like in the case of Sri Lanka, it's 10%. 90% of Sri Lanka's debt belongs mostly to private financial corporations who make money by loaning money, uh, high interest rates, short term to countries who are in trouble. The third point, the fallacy is that where the loans were used, as my friend uh, Mr. Rana Raja says, China's loans go to infrastructure projects, productive projects. You can see the tangible results. The 90% of the loans, the other loans, they go to solve fiscal and trade deficit, which means you take it in the right hand and it disappears in the left hand. And it has no impact on society. What happens is that this debt accumulates. It becomes like a huge mountain, which you have to, in catch 22, you have to borrow new money to to pay the old debt. Let me go to our African guest, Mr. Ono Naiju. Um, Africa will be the place, some people say, it is the arena for major power competition. Now that uh, Western countries led by the United States also coming up with their version of infrastructure uh, plans or aid plans for Africa. What do you see coming in the next five to 10 years as China continues to deepen and optimize its cooperation with African countries? Africa is open to international partnership and uh, China and the world to pay attention to Africa uh, using the platform of United Nations and other international platform to ask the world to engage with Africa more vigorously and Africa is open to partnership. Yes, the Belt and Road has significantly, significantly impacted in Africa simply because um, it brings along some of the issues, it raises issues that Africa has been profoundly concerned for several years, especially connectivity, infrastructure connectivity. If you remember, the whole idea of Pan-Africanism was an Africa that could engage with itself, trade with itself, and the Africa that is integrated and could build an economy of scale and become an asset to the world. But this did not happen for several decades on account of deficit of funding and infrastructure to build an integrated Africa. Mr. Zhang, let me come back to you. Exactly what has China been trying to do with the Belt and Road Initiative to build infrastructure, not just roads and bridges, but also digital infrastructure, connectivity, um, in, uh, information and communication technology, so on and so forth? Well, I think China's uh, aim for the, uh, the, uh, the BRI certainly has been multifaceted and also has always been, uh, you know, evolving so to be in pace uh, with the global development. But I think one thing has always been the priority uh, of the BRI development is really sustainable development. Uh, you know, uh, as a global community, we have committed ourselves to achieve the 17 SDG goals by 2030. And uh, by the most recent uh, UN report, we're only about 20% through with all of those goals. And that's really a uh, very some uh, scenario. And I think China really wants to step up uh, with its own very unique strengths and efforts uh, and also approach to really contribute uh, into right, that. Right. Mr. Um, Rana Raja, let me get to you. Of course, as you said, uh, the Belt and Road has benefited countries uh, along uh, some of the ancient Silk Road uh, routes. Now, looking ahead, how do you think 
this initiative can even better serve the needs of countries that are needing development. What do you think can be taken away from the past decade to be brought in the next decade so that it becomes more sustainable, it makes better economic sense for both China and the countries that are involved? Belt and Road Initiative was first uh, one built, one road. Then it changed its name. So one of the most important functional factors of China is its ability to reform. I believe in the next decade, China and the member states are focusing high level, high level development on these projects. We have to go through the finances, we have to go through the feasibilities, and we have to improve the businesses. And but for the, a country and like Sri Lanka, for a country like Sri Lanka, what do the local people value the most, or what um, social impact needs to be taken into consideration in order for Belt and Road to, to be even more beneficial? We came to the BRI after a civil war of 30 years. So the road system, the first was to uplift the road system. As the Chinese say, mm -hmm. we need to build a road in order to develop the country first. So the road system is there. If you see the tourism, the impact it has done to the communities uh, throughout Sri Lanka, it's, it's huge. The tourism which come to Sri Lanka, about I think about 60% of tourists go to the south through the uh, roads built uh, to Colombo and uh, south. We have a growing economy on top of us. Yeah. The Indian economy, they need a lot of products, they need a lot of services. We need to help them as well. Uh, just to add an example, the CICT terminal, which was built 10 years ago, supports the Indian economy more than Sri Lankan economy. Mm -hmm. It transships around 40% of transshipments to Indian markets. So 40% of Indian transshipments depend on the Chinese terminal in Sri Lanka. So look, even though India disagreed, they benefit through the Belt and Road Initiative. So it's a win. It's it's the true meaning of win-win. China gets a win. Sri Lanka gets a win. Even the regional big players get a win. Even though these, some disagree uh, for this initiative. Let me go to Mr. Azkari. Um, the Belt and Road Initiative is not just about roads, bridges, economics, or geopolitics. It's also about galleries, about museums, about libraries. Actually, uh, I understand from the numbers China gave out, 300 cultural institutions in 75 countries are stepping up the exchanges because of the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, but these get no mentions, almost no mention at all in international media coverage. Why does China want to do these things as well? I think the people to people and cultural exchange is one of the five pillars of the Belt and Road Initiative. It's at the bottom of the five in the list, but it's a very, very important because that's what can help us ease the tension we have in the world. We have the world going into a very, very dangerous period and what can both remove all the misunderstandings and all, all the lies is that when people meet each other, when people from cultural, from uh, media, when uh, students can meet uh, together. These things are very, very crucial to bring understanding among peoples and nations. We have to leave it there because of time constraints. Many thanks to Zhang Jianyu, Executive Director of the BRI Green Development Institute, Mr. Uh, Yasiru Rana Raja, Founding Director of the Belt and Road Initiative Sri Lanka, Charles Okechuku Ono Naiju, Director of the Center for China Studies of Nigeria, and Hussein Askari, Vice President of the Belt and Road Institute in Sweden, also strategic analyst of the Schiller Institute. And with that, we come to the end of this special edition of the Headline Buster, brought to you by me, Lucien, on behalf of the whole team. Thank you very much for joining us, and many thanks to the viewers who send us your questions or comments. We'll see you next time on The Point with Lucien.